Good morning. Here we are. I am just checking to see if I am actually alive because um, there's lots of weird things. I'm still, <laughs> I'm getting back to my um, my normal routine. I was gone for, for since last Wednesday to Global Convention and it was amazing. I learned so many different things. I got to meet the people firsthand. I worked with the top earner in the company. Um, I'm being mentored by her. I want to share a little bit about her story. Today, we are, um, we're studying the millionaire training, the golden principles that created the top network marketers of today. So um, we will be starting on page one with the long-haired construction worker, hippie construction worker. But before I do that, um, let's do our normal stuff. So we start with gratitude. My name is Tammy Todd and I'm in Huntington Beach, California. And I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful for the company that I'm with. I have, I, I was so I love this company and I love, I've loved it all, for all along, but I've, I've, it's just, I've fallen in love with the company, with the people, with the whole, um, the mission, the vision, everything, even more than ever before. So I'm just so, so grateful and so excited to be here. Um, the one thing that I learned, um, even though I've known it, and especially since from our training is consistency, consistency is key. And that's why I'm here again today. And I've already done my workout. So I look, um, a little bit, you know, <laughs> doesn't, I don't care. I'm here to do, I'm here to help you in any way I can. And I want to share some of the amazing experiences that I had and um, in a way that hopefully will inspire you as well. So, but before we do that, um, my goals for today are I'm going to reach out to at least 10 people um, doing my daily demos. I've got so many things I want to really make notes of some of the experiences and I want to go over some of the training again. And um, really there's a couple stories from a couple of the top leaders that I really want to re-listen to so that I um, can embrace and embody the stories. Cause it's just so incredible to hear. Um, and I'm not talking about the stories of, of what the products have done. I'm talking about the, the opportunity of the company's experience, what, what they were going through, why they got involved, that kind of thing. It's just been incredible. So, um, but before we do that, we're going to go ahead and do our morning meditation. Oops, I didn't do this part. Let me redo this. Let's try this again. Let's try this again. All right, where'd you guys go? <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. I paused. All right, for some reason, I'm having a real difficult time, probably because I've been gone and I just just got my computer out of the um, out of my bag. Let's try it one more time, and if it doesn't work, then we're just gonna not do it. Okay, let here we go. So take a deep breath, a deep breath of life. The Talmud says every blade of grass has an angel leaning over it, whispering, grow, grow, grow. That blade of grass will press through cement, seeking the light. And that same pull of becoming is on and in you. It is the spiral pull of becoming that is everywhere present in the universe, for the universe itself is ever seeking fuller, freer, expanded life. And you are part of this wondrous spiral of becoming. Your very DNA is a spiral. And you feel that pull to the more. Learning to work in concert and cooperation with the great laws of the universe. Open doors of possibilities that prior would have seemed completely impossible and only for the few, not you. But now, through your interest, your study, and your willingness, you're beginning to understand 
that not only is dream building your right, but your responsibility. For you have come here to give the gift of you, without which the fabric of creation is incomplete. For you did not create you. You can't even breathe you. You're being breathed by the great spirit of life itself and something wonderful is happening with you right now. It is this thing called life. You've been given a mind and a body, emotions and spirit. You are spirit having a human experience using the mind and body and emotions as your expressing field for what you ultimately will choose as the demonstration of the life you know. So in this sacred moment, activate the faculties you have and know this, you are an image maker, made in the image and after the likeness of the one who gives you life, your mind thinks in pictures. Okay, I needed that. I haven't heard that since um since we did the last one. So anyway, um, we are on the long-haired hippie construction worker, and um, and I would really I'm, I'm going to go ahead and before I do this, I really want to share. So Trish and Bob Swinkler, they are um, the top network or they're the top earner in my company, and they are incredible people. I got to know them on a personal level, and it's just been. Um, I just feel so blessed that I'm like Larry talks about in this book, you know, when, when people see potential in you and they pour into you, that's how I feel. I feel like I'm being poured into by my upline by, and, and Trish is my upline. She's only, I think six people above me. And so I'm so, so blessed to, to now know, um, who I'm under, like all of these things, I've got these personal connections, not only on zoom, but actually personal connections. So, um, Bob and Bob and Trish, they ha had been in another network marketing company and they were doing really, really well. They had gone up the ranks and, um, they had, I think they have three kids. I don't know how many kids they have, but anyway, so they were in this other network com network marketing company and they were doing really, really well. And the company sold the co the, the main part of, you know, they sold the company to somebody else and then it was being mismanaged and they started losing like they started losing their customers. They started losing, like their, their business started dwindling and it was dwindling and it was dwindling. And, and it was, I mean, their whole livelihood was based on this income and it got to the point where they couldn't, they were going to lose everything. They did. They weren't earning enough money to pay their mortgage. So they had, a, they had their mortgage. They had, um, they had a, a, a lake house and then they had, they actually had a um, commercial building because they had built this building and they were going to bring people in and they were going to, um, they were going to rent it out to earn income. But this was just before that whole bubble of in 2008. So they couldn't fill it. Once they got it built, they couldn't get any, any tenants to come in. So um, they started looking for a new company and they were looking for an opportunity, but it had to be the, the people and the top had to be of, um, of integrity, high integrity. And they wanted to know what's going to happen. And, you know, when, because the founder is, is Virtus, Virtus Norton, and he started this company at 69 years old and Trish and Bob said, okay, Bob, or okay, um, Virtus, you're a great guy. This is a great company, but what happens when, when you decide to walk away, what's going to happen to the company? I don't want to invest all this time into creating this, this amazing team or this, you know, legacy. And then it all go away like it happened before. And um, and this company is so different than most. It is of the highest integrity. So since then, obviously, Tyler, the son, has taken over. It's a family-run business. Well, it's, it's, it's not just a family-run business, but it is a family-run business. And all of the people in the top are all totally involved. And, and it's staying and it's owned completely by by the um by the foundation the, by the founders so it's not going to be sold off it's not going to be turned over to somebody else it's this 
it's they will keep the integrity of the mission in the company and that's very important to me so on that note um, so anyway so so during that so they um they started out they and they were really they were going to lose their house they were going to lose everything so they had to get going fast they started really fast and they ranked up they they ranked and they ranked and they ranked and they finally now they are the top earner in my company and they are just incredible incredible people this is one of the things so one of the um one of the things that our company does is they and a lot of companies do this they have a mission that they that they contribute to you know that there's some kind of a um a company or or an entity, a nonprofit that they that they are supporting or in part of. Well, our company actually has their own nonprofit, and they go and do missions um, all over the world, right? So um, when when they were on stage talking about this mission and how you know to because they always drive the the um, say they they get, drive donations, especially during conventions and stuff. So Denny Robinson, she is the second, I think she's the second highest earner in the company. She was on stage and she, she said that anybody that contributes to the, to the foundation, that she will match it up to $30,000, except for, she did say, except for um, Trish and Bob Swankler. She said, she's not going to, she's, she won't match them. So um, then Trish got on stage and she said that she would, she would do the same thing. She would double or, or she would do 30% to every, you know, everything that came in from that point on up to 30, you know, like up to, so if you donated up to $30,000, she would match it. Right. So um, both of them had said that. And then, then Trish took it to the next level. She said, you know what? She goes, I'm going to make it 50. I will donate up to like, I will match every donation up to $50,000. And I just, I was in awe that people can actually just do that. Like I'm going to match every donation. So imagine how you would feel if you could actually do that. If you had that kind of money and from that, you can just give freely $50,000 in, in one go <laughs> and not think twice about it, you know? And so anyway, enough about that. I'm going to go ahead and start on the long haired hippie construction worker. And I am going to share more about my company as we go through this. And I, I, I may start shifting things um, because I think it's very important for people to get to know their, their, their system, their company, their everything. And, and that's very, very important. And this, it's talked about in this book. So I'm going to stick to most of it, but I will be adding parts because I think it's important. So page one, you know what we are, what this is all about. I'm going to share some ideas with you here that have helped many of us over the years, especially me, become successful. And success is always relative to where you are and what you've been, and where you've been. It's an exciting day for me since my first meeting at Herbalife and being involved in it. This is a training class that Mark Hughes, Herbalife founder, and I talked about since day one. We're real excited about this, and we're able to share some of the things with you aside from the product line, aside from the marketing system. A very important one a very important part of your business work. I really appreciate all those of you who have taken time to be here who are not part of Herbalife. You're certainly welcome to take some notes here today. And if this can benefit you or your business or your job or your profession or your career, you're certainly welcome to some of these ideas. We're going to be talking about Herbalife primarily here in this book. And I'm going to be talking primarily about ASEA when I talk about things from my company and what I'm doing, but it doesn't matter what company you're in. This is just what I'm sharing with you and he's sharing with you on things that are working for him. Um, and you should be able to use some of these concepts in all areas of your life. You know, when I was sitting in the back of the room earlier and I saw people out here and I could feel the excitement. I mean, just imagine, I mean, I just came back from conference and just when you walk in the room and you're in the back of the room and you can, you can just feel and see the excitement in the room. Well, it made a, a little, it made me a little humble to come up and share some of these things with you. The things that I'm going to share with you today are things that are part of my life. They're part of me. They're not things that I've developed. They're things that were shared with me about 13 years ago that made sense to me. And I applied some of these things to my life and it started making a significant change in it. My background prior to network marketing was strictly construction work. That's all I've ever known in my life. 
construction work. That was it. Back then, I lived in a small city up north near San Jose, California. Do you know where Livermore, California is? It's just a small city. I lived up there and went to school up there. I grew up doing construction work because my dad did construction work and my brothers did and a couple of my cousins. So we're kind of had our own built-in crew there. I was doing construction for 13, since doing construction at 13 years old in the summers in between school. And I liked it. Quite honestly, I never thought about doing anything different than construction work. That's the only thing I ever thought about. It wasn't necessarily a goal or anything. It was just that I grew up. It was what I grew up with and I was going to do it. It's just how it was going to be. I do remember this though. I remember my income goal. I did have an income goal back then. My goal was to earn $25,000 a year, not a month, a year. It was 1968. I knew back then. And I said to myself, if I can just get to $25,000 a year, I'm going to have it made. And that's the only real goal as I understood it at this point. So now it's springtime and we're ready. We're getting ready to go into the spring season. And I don't know what will, and I know what will be happening. I will be getting ready to come out of the rainy season. Like I had all the other previous years. It was around this time that I was fortunate enough to get exposed to a different kind of opportunity. I will never forget that. And I'd like to take a couple of minutes here to share that with you. It was my first exposure into the, into, into the direct sales industry as we have her here in Herbalife. A good friend of mine had found a little part of business, a little part-time business, and got a hold of me one night to tell me about it. His name was Mike Fuller. And like me, Mike Fuller was also a construction worker. I really respected him because Mike was different than most of the construction workers I knew. He had a couple of homes and a couple of dollars put away, put aside, and I respected him besides liking him. I respected him a lot. He called me one night. It was a Monday night, and I'll never forget this. He was very excited, and Mike was not that kind of person. He started telling me about this opportunity that he'd found and how he thought that he could make some real serious money. He thought it would be a good fit. For, it would fit me like a glove. Besides that, he sounded like he was walking three feet off the ground. Now, that's how he sounded that night. And he got my attend, my interest way up. Even though he had gotten my interest way up, I was hesitant. He had called me at 6.30 at night and wanted me to go over to the Hyatt House Hotel in San Jose and be there by 8 p.m., which was a good 45 minutes away. I wasn't hesitant because of his excitement or because I didn't believe in him. I already knew I was going. I was hesitant because I didn't know. I didn't want to go to a meeting. My hair wasn't right. So I said, will you call me back in 10 minutes? I was excited because of his excitement. And I was curious about anything that could get Mike going like that. But it really had, but I really had long hair and a beard to match it. I was looking pretty good though. I got to share that with you. And so I did check in the mirror to see if my hair was right. And if, if not, if I could get it going and I decided I looked okay and I could go. He called me back and I said, okay, I'm coming. I was really excited about this. At first I was nervous and everything, but I was excited because I'd never been to a business meeting before. And I'm going over here, there and jutting around and I have no idea what I'm going to see. I'm more into getting ready and what's going to take place than the opportunity that he's talking about because it was a business meeting and I didn't know what to wear. So I just put on some of my best beads. Yes, I was that kind of guy. <laughs> and I just... I just, in today's world, it's so, so different, you know, going to the event this weekend and just seeing all the people and just being who they are and just in their real selves and everybody embracing everybody, no matter what they were like, no matter what they look like, no matter what their um, complications were, no matter, no matter if they were in a wheelchair, no matter what, you know, it was just an, an incredible experience. So I wanted to look the best I could. I went to the Hyatt House Hotel and I will never forget walking by. By the way, I'd never been in a hotel and that's the truth. I'd been to a few motels before, but never a hotel. There is a difference. My hair was down to the middle of my back. And, you know, I was walking just right and doing everything I could to look my best. If, you, if you're going to go there, you might as well do it with style. <laughs> and that's so true. When I walked in there, I know the people thought they were hallucinating. That's the first time they'd seen anybody like me in there, a long hair hippie. And I won't ever forget it. First of all, when you come into the room and sat down, everybody left. You know what I mean? Today, if somebody like me who looked so different walked in, nobody would think anything about it. And that is so true. Back then, you didn't necessarily want to be the person sitting next to me, right? And so everybody moved away. 
that didn't bother me at all because I'm excited I, I, because I'm into everything that's happening around me. And I'm no sooner get there and the meeting started. The presenters got me excited that night. I never really thought about anything at all was going to develop from me going there, but they got me excited by some of the things that I, that they shared when it was all over. Mike Spencer walked up to me and he looked at me and he said, you don't want to do this. Do you? <laughs> he started shaking his head. Have you ever had that experience? When I said, yes, I do. He didn't know if he wanted me to sign up or not. Well, I got started the next day. And the first week I had some incredible things happen to me. I got off to a good start because of Mike and his sponsor. Right away, I got into tra a training class that was kind of like this. And they were real, and it really got my attention. The first week, I earned $600 working part-time. I was just a babbling idiot after that because I didn't think it was possible. I would never made $600 working full-time in a week, let alone part-time. So it was really something for me. I remember what happened at the end of the day. It was a Friday. It was five days after I signed up and a gentleman who I worked, who I used to work with came up to me to say, hello, I wanted to recruit this guy. We used to work together doing cement work. So I was drawing the marketing plan out on the cement there. And I was telling him that you could do all this and you can do that. And he looked at me and he said, if this is so good, then why aren't you doing, why are you here doing construction? Why aren't you doing this full time? And I thought about it. By golly, you got a point. And I quit. I did. That impressed him. I got him into my business and I left. I did. I left my tools and everything right there. And I told him, I'm not coming back. And about two hours later, I thought, hmm, what do I do now? You get all excited and you do these crazy things. What if $600 isn't going to come in the next week? What's, what's going to happen to my family? The most important thing that happened to me was that I got off to a really good start. I started thinking maybe this could really work out for me after all. After becoming full-time, the first couple of months to 90 days were very positive for me. Then I went through some transitions personally. And that's when these concepts that I'm going to share with you today come into play. You see, when things are moving, when things are going well, you can do anything and it'll work. But what happens when you stub your toe a little? What happens when you get a little confused? What happens then? When you're not sure of the direction you're going in? When... And that's when concepts like this will come into play. You have to buy a Cadillac. I was taking Mike Spencer up north, driving across the, Monte the San Monteo Bridge to get to San Francisco Airport. And I had this little black Ford. Let me explain my car to you. I had this little black Ford and it wasn't just normal. It was really low. I had lowered it to the ground so I'd be looking good driving down the road. However, there were a couple of problems with this car. Just a couple. One problem was it didn't have an emergency brake which was no big deal, only it didn't go into park either. So when I stopped, I had a problem with it rolling backwards. I'd fixed this problem with a little cement rock that I made. I kept it behind the seat. And when I stopped, I was kind of going downhill. I just ease up on it and I put the rock on the ground so I could roll up on it. I got so good at it that nobody could tell I was even doing it. The second problem was it had burnt, out, burnt valves in it. So it sounded like blah, 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 blah all the time. Even though I'd started making all this money and stuff, I was concerned. I didn't want to spend money because I, because what if my su success didn't last? What if it was a fluke? That was the truth of the matter. I remember I was, as I was thinking, as I was taking Mike Spencer across the San Mateo bridge, he looked at me and he said, I don't want to ever ride in this dirty, dirty, blankety, blank, blank, like Ford again, go buy yourself a Cadillac. He had a Cadillac and he kept telling people, all his people, you have to buy a Cadillac. If you're going into business, as soon as you start making money, start showing the money here. Start showing people that you're, you really believe in what you're doing. And then, and that just didn't compute to me at all, but it was exciting. I replied, okay, but listen, you don't understand. I can't afford a, a Cadillac yet. He looked at me square in the eyes and he said, let me tell you something, Larry, you can't afford not to have a Cadillac. That made sense to me. I came back across the bridge to the San Mateo, across the San Mateo bridge. The Cadillac dealership used to be Buchanan Smith. Now it's Lou Doty. I tell myself, I'm going to get me a Cadillac, never believing in a million years that I was going, that it was going to happen. First of all, when I pulled into the driveway, you've got to understand, I got my big tall boots on and I had my hair down, got my beads and my little shades. You know, they don't like to see me coming in there at all. <laughs> of course, because my car is so low, it scrapes as I go across the driveway, pulling into the dealership. I can see them through the window and they're just having a ball with this whole deal. First thing is I want to be as cool as I can be. And you wouldn't know it you wouldn't know it. I forgot to put the cement block down. My car starts taking off and I'm walking real slow and cool after it. And it starts beating me. It was the first deal that happened. 
The second deal that happened, I went inside and nobody would wait on me. You know what I mean? No one. I kept walking around and acting cool, all cool. I kept waiting and nobody showed up. Finally, it was getting obvious. I'd been there for 15 minutes. And I was doing as much as I could to get some kind of attention to me. Either way, they drew straws or they got the rookie salesman to come out to wait on me. I'm not sure. They were just having a ball with this whole deal. And finally, the guy came out and he says, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I want an El Dorado. You would never believe how I said it. I said it real good, very arrogantly. Mike Spencer told me to be assertive, and I was. The salesman got nervous because he could sense that this was the real deal. So he says, well, let me get my, let me get my manager. Off he went to get his manager, and out came Gil Wilson. Now, Gil Wilson and I have become real good friends since this, but Gil is an epitome of a Cadillac salesman. The black suit with the pin, the um, thin stripe, the, the thin stripe, right? The little tiny skinny tie, black horn rim glasses, sunglasses or glasses with gray temples. You know what I'm talking about? That's Gil Wilson, a really nice guy. Gil Wilson came out to me and he says, yes, can I help you with, out with something here? What can I do for you? And I told him I, what I told the other salesman. Yes, I want an Eldorado. This was in 1968 and the Eldorados were very rare. They only came out in 1967 and there were very few Eldorados, maybe, maybe only three. I had to have something that was different. So I wanted an Eldorado. He told me, well, we don't have any Eldorados available. And I asked him, well, what about this green one? It's a forest green Eldorado was with a kind of beige top. And I'm telling you, it was beautiful. It just got me really think going. It got me when I saw it, because when I drove up, the sun was shining on it and it was just gorgeous. Oh, that one sold. Well, what's it doing here if it's sold? I couldn't even believe I said that. <laughs> I was really getting in that in this day and feeling my oats. The gentleman's supposed to come and pick it up on Monday. He's supposed to pick, come and pick it up on Monday. Well, this is Friday, so I persist. Well, I need an Eldorado and I need it today. Without missing a beat, I told him, I've got a very important business meeting that I have to go to tonight and I need an Eldorado. I can't sell you that one today, but if he doesn't pick it up, you can have it on Monday. Monday will not work at all. Listen, come with me. He took me to the back where they were unloading the new cars off the truck. And there was a gold Eldorado. I don't know if you'd seen the cars when they come off the trucks. They don't have hubcaps, hubcaps on them and they're really ugly. They've got that stuff on them to protect them. It was a real ugly deal. And I didn't like it at all. I told him straight up, I don't like that one. But you, you're either got to have this one or you've got to wait till Monday. Okay, let's go back in and talk. He took me to the office and I'll, and I, <laughs> really call the, that's what I call the confession booth. You know what I'm talking about? When you go in there to buy something, you got to confess all your sins before they let you buy it. Gil wrote down a few figures on a piece of paper and he slid it over to me. I looked at it and I said, I'll take it. He couldn't believe it, right? Truth is, neither could I. You have no idea what I was going through. I was having so much fun and I had no idea what the end result was going to be. And then he said, okay, if that's acceptable to you, then I'll get going on the paperwork. Okay. But before we do the paperwork, I've got to be assured that the car can be ready by 4.30 p.m. today. Can you get the car ready? If you can't, well, I'll just, I'll, I, I've got to know right now. Oh, I assure you, Mr. Thompson, he calls me Mr. Thompson now. We'll have the car ready. Okay, now hold it. Can the papers be ready by 4.30? Because if not, I'm going down the road to Smith Cadillac. He looked at me and he said, I get your point. And he started writing. I went home and I had about 45 minutes to kill. He was going to call me back to make sure that everything was going to be taken care of. And I got cleared on the whole thing. Honestly, I never thought it was going to happen. I was surprised when he called me at 4 p.m. and said, Mr. Thompson, come get your car. <laughs> I let out a scream that you wouldn't believe. I smoked it back to the dealership. I don't even remember how I got there. I do remember I drove my Ford right up to the front and left it right there. I didn't even hide the rock. I just got out and put the rock there. When I looked up and saw the sun, the sun shining on my new Cadillac, it looks good. I can't even believe how good this thing looks. And it was much better than the green one, maybe because I knew it was going to be mine. I said, okay, let's get on with it. I have, I got to get going on this deal. I was nervous that I was going to change my mind and I wanted to get out of there with my car. And he told me, well, it's going to take about 45 minutes. There's one other client ahead of us and my girl's working on the paperwork and it's going to take about another 45 minutes. I said, I don't have another 45 minutes. Can I just sign the paperwork and have you fill it out and fill it out and, and send me my copies? He said, well, of course I can. Okay, let's do that. I'm really going for this thing. I signed at the bottom knowing full well that he can put in any figures he wants. And I thought to myself, well, that's all right. At least I'm going to have a Cadillac for 90 days. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? For 90 days, I knew I was going to look really, really good. So I did that. And by now, by this time, and this is the truth, everybody in this whole agency is getting into this thing. The salesmen are into it. The mechanics are coming out. Some of them got their wives and a couple of their girlfriends there. They can't believe this deal is going on. We go out there and Dil, Gil Wilson is pretty excited about this whole thing. And he's really excited about it. He's explaining everything to me and how it works and, and everything. And I said, listen, I haven't got time for that. I've just got to get going. Well, listen, he told me in the glove box, in the glove box is the operator's manual that explains everything to you. Meanwhile, I'm pushing every button and I can't believe it. The seats go every which way. I mean, it, this is just really unbelievable to me. This Cadillac is, well, until you experience something like that, if you've never experienced it, you'll never understand that. I'm pushing all the buttons and going back and forth, the AM and FM, and I can even hear the dust on the needle of the stereo, the station on my stereo. I'm convinced of that. And everything is perfect. Finally, I said, I have got to go. And I started the baby up and, and it's, back, I, it's backed in. And for those of you who live up north, you know, it's a real long driveway out there. I adjusted the seat and I got my mirror set on this one over here. And then I got my mirror set over there and we're in the steering wheel down, brought I put it, brought it out. And it feels good. I said to myself, this is it. And I started to leave. I told Gil, thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. And then I buzzed up my power window and eased on the off. I eased out of the parking lot. Just as I turn, I'm doing two or three miles an hour. And I look up and there's Mr. Wilson kind of trotting alongside of me. And I thought, golly, what a friendly, friendly salesman, you know? So I give it one of these deals where I just kind of wave. And then I get that baby up to about 10 miles an hour. And I can't believe it. I look up and there's Mr. Wilson, you know, still trotting alongside my Eldorado. Finally, I look over to see that I've got the boy's tie caught in the window. I slam on my brakes and he goes, whoop. <laughs> and with a friendly wave, I buzz down the window. Unbelievable. True story. If I can do it, you can do it. After about a year, about a year later, I was living in, out in Oklahoma and I wanted to get another Cadillac. I called up Mr. Wilson and I was ready to tell him what I wanted and everything. The plan was to have my folks drive it out. I wasn't sure he was going to remember me at all when I called him, but he certainly did. I share this story with you for several reasons. Number one, I enjoy telling it, as you can tell, but also to give you an idea about where I'm coming from, what happened to me, and what has taken place in my life. I think more importantly to share with you that if, if I can do something like this and make the significant changes in my life that I've made, you can too. I really, it really doesn't make any difference about our ages and it doesn't make any difference about our business background or education level. What makes a difference is about how we feel about ourselves and our opportunity. I encourage you all to take, a really, to take really good notes as we go over this and hopefully it'll impact the impact that it'll have on you. It'll have on, on, all, on a lot of us. So um, that it, it's just so incredible. I just, when, when he's talking about um, one of the things that when I was in convention and they were talking about age is, you know, that's one of the, the peop, one of the stumbling blocks people say is, oh, I'm too old. Virtus Norton didn't start ASEA until he was 69 years old. So there is no such thing as too old, too young, too fat, too, too skinny, too, too tall, too short. You are exactly who you need to be right now. Just embrace that. Keep it simple and enjoy it. So I will see you tomorrow.